are we going to act as if this planet belongs to us and we can do what the hell we want and everything else will just fit in around it? Or are we going to start saying, well, maybe, just maybe, we ought to put ourselves not at the center of the picture, but just as part of a wider web? How would we live if we thought that other creatures had a right to this as well? That we didn't have a right to just effectively assume that all of this is just a backdrop to our activities? VPRO Tegenlicht over onze relatie met de natuur. Eeuwenlang hebben we gedaan alsof we boven de natuur staan en haar volledig konden uitputten. Maar uiteindelijk zijn we ervan afhankelijk. Kunnen we de verbinding met de natuur weer herstellen? We gaan terug naar de toekomst. Door veranderend landgebruik over de hele wereld zie je dat de ruimte voor ecosystemen en de functies van ecosystemen maar ook de ruimte voor dieren om te kunnen leven, steeds kleiner wordt. Ja, dat is echt enorm snel gegaan. En dat is tot het punt aangekomen waarin we eigenlijk nu in de zogenaamde zesde uitstervingscrisis uh, zitten. Waarbij één op de acht soorten van leven op de aarde met uitsterven wordt bedreigd. Meer dan een miljoen verschillende soorten. En natuurbehoud reageerde eigenlijk een beetje tegenstrijdig. Niet door de bron aan te pakken... Maar door hekken te bouwen om natuurgebieden, om natuur tegen de mens verder te beschermen. Het belangrijkste argument om geen hekken om natuurgebieden uiteindelijk te zetten, is dat je daardoor letterlijk en figuurlijk ja, die vervreemding tussen mens en natuur verder aanjaagt. Dan leer je niet samenleven met de natuur. We're all animals. We're all the identical to the people who, who painted the, 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 the Paleolithic cave walls 30.000 years ago. Um, we haven't changed biologically at all, or very little. We're still wild creatures, we've never been domesticated. So we can put this pattern of civilization on us, but it can fall away very quickly. So what's underneath it? And how do we get back to that? The reason that these passions roil us all the time is that that's what we still are. We're still these animals and our bodies and our souls react to the wild world around us. We like to pretend that central heating and Wi-Fi connections have somehow put a, a wall of glass between us and, and and the rest of nature, but it, it's not there. We're still in it. We are chaining ourselves to this way of life that we are not evolved to have those kinds of lives. Um, and so if we can break out of our chains and get out there and be in, in, the, in the forest, be at the ocean, because once we're away from it and stuck in these places and it's cut off from nature, then we stop caring about it. And we kind of stop caring about who we are. You belong in the forest too. We all do. We all belong in nature. And we've got to reconnect with it, I think, and then make decisions. We have to make collective decisions about, you know, that we care about. <laughs> The vision that we can continue to develop based on extraction and pollution is not viable. We can see that just with the case study of climate change. We know that we're going to uh, create a, a world which is, if not unlivable, is going to be continually moving in that direction. What is needed fundamentally for, as a basic condition of sustainability, is to take the market out of governing nature and to emplace democratic conditions, democratic relations, democratic rule. I remember when five years ago, five, six years ago, when I, was, I, I first was engaging in a very big way with um, the whole idea of how do we create a legal duty of care. And I'd come up with, my starting point had been a universal declaration of earth rights or planetary rights. And why is it that if we've got a universal declaration of human rights, why don't we have the equivalent for the Earth? In Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Wanganui River, which is sacred to local Maori people, has been given the same legal rights as a person. After 118 years 
of making applications to different levels of government. This is our tūpuna awa. This is our ancestor. The earth is in need of a good lawyer. <laughs> because the earth and communities right across the world, their voices aren't being heard. It's rather like representing, you know, for instance, in child care cases, you represent a child. Now, a two-year-old cannot give you an eloquent sentence as to what their needs are and how they're being harmed, but you can bring in a guardian ad litem that speaks on their behalf, and the indicators are there. So, for instance, a child who's been physically harmed is covered in bruises and cuts or, or has uh, brain damage. You know, this, this can be actually scientifically shown. And it's rather the same with the Earth, you can actually show scientifically that there's harm at play. Oh, don't forget that actually in the 19th century, corporations started being given rights like people. Well, I'm glad we're moving on from that now and giving rights to rivers. Let's extend the whole idea of what rights are. The basic principle is absolutely clear that you don't foul the nest. You take care of the place that's going to take care of your offspring. Wil je meer weten over onze relatie met de natuur? Duik in het archief van de toekomst en ontdek deze afleveringen en andere thema's van VPRO Tegenlicht.